Hello and welcome to Too Many Movies, the podcast where we discuss DVDs, Blu-rays, and even the occasional VHS tape. I am your host, Hal, and with me here today, Lazy, introduce you. Uh, hello, I am Lazy Bones. I... I have a letterbox. I used to have a Twitter until uh, I realized Twitter is a shitstorm, so I don't use it anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty much interests, movies, animation. Yeah, I mean, I used I used to have I used to use the YouTube channel. I don't really use it that often anymore. But yeah, I'm just kind of a cinephile trying to watch movies I haven't seen before, and yeah, nice a, a fellow cinephile who watches cinema. Hmm, who could hey, have guessed? Speaking of cinema, yeah. Speaking of cinema, uh, Cocaine Bear. We watched it. <laughs> uh, I remember. Yeah. Uh, so, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna intro it. So, Cocaine Bear. We watched it, and uh, yeah, it's kind of the one of the big movies of this year. This is actually the first 2023 movie I've actually seen. I have not yet watched Ant Man or Knock at the Cabin or. Mithrigan, but I have seen Cocaine Bear, and uh, I guess to start off, Lazy, uh, what did you think of Cocaine Bear? I think uh, I like uh, just before I give my like quick thoughts. I remember when we were like trying to discuss like what movie we should discuss, like after I chose like a DVD or Blu-ray in your collection. I think we were kind of like wondering what what other movie should we talk about, and like I was just struggling to come up with something. And then he said, you know what? I wanted to just talk about Cocaine Bear. And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I try to talk about as many other movies as possible on this podcast besides my movie collection. Because, like, I feel like, you know, if I narrowed it down to just movies in my collection, like, I'm kind of alienating a lot of people because not every movie I own is something that people have seen. And I have tried to do recent releases just to kind of, like, get a conversation going. But then... Every time I'm just like, hey, you want to talk about a recent release? People are like, no. And it's like, okay. But now we're back to talking about recent releases, and it's Cocaine Bear. <laughs> <laughs> perfect way so, to start it off. Yeah, perfect way to make a return. I think the last recent release I talked about was Black Adam. So, uh, Oops. Which, uh, controversial opinion here. I think Cocaine Bear is better than Black Adam. Uh, no ship, Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, you start off by giving me your thoughts on Cocaine Bear. What did you think? Okay, so I was excited for this movie for a while now, ever since they announced it. And I can say I really liked it. It's not, it doesn't like reach what it's, or it doesn't really reach its creative potential, I don't think, uh, mm -hmm. to be fair. Because like, you know, it's produced by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. He usually make a lot of, they take a lot of like, one note kind of concepts like Legos or even, I don't know, I guess Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs or even Clone High, which is just like about these historical figures you want high school. They're usually great at like taking very familiar concepts we've seen before or just ones that are kind of one note, but it depends on how they execute them. And they usually do that very well. They didn't write the script or anything, but they produced it. And Elizabeth Banks is the director of it. And, uh, you know, she. I think she voiced uh, Wild Style in the Lego movie, which they directed. So, I mean, I'd yeah. say that, I mean, like, it was a very fun time for me besides the first 20 minutes, which were kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so here's the thing. I was not expecting this movie to really wow me in any way. And so I'll say this. I liked it. I had fun. Um, it, but I will say it is definitely not what you would think it would be like when you think cocaine bear you think like wild stupid crazy movie and i am a connoisseur when it comes to those kinds of movies like i was expecting well i wasn't expecting because but like you think i would be expecting like a so insane that it's fun kind of movie like a akin to like a so bad it's good kind of movie you know what i'm trying to say oh yeah mm -hmm. which Unfortunately, it doesn't really reach those levels. It got a lot closer than I was expecting, which I will commend the film on. But, you know, as I was kind of uh, predicting, yes, it it is a, 
unfortunately a little too standard at times. I think that's what's kind of holding it back from truly being like, like you said, up to its fullest potential. Like, yeah, if this movie was actually as bonkers as it was promising, then I'd be singing the, the, the I'd be singing its praises like you wouldn't believe. Um, but I didn't hate it. I didn't, I wasn't as disappointed when it came to that. And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be people rolling their eyes when I say disappointed because they assume I mean like, oh, you expected <laughs> Citizen Kane or Shawshank Redemption. It's like, no, I expected Lake Michigan Monster or CIA. CIA, I, I, yeah. I, I still didn't get that, you know? It, so it's somewhere in that middle, you know? There's that sweet, sweet middle you got to hit. And that's what, I, again, Lake Michigan Monster and CIA, those hit that sweet, sweet middle. This, it almost makes it, but not really. And to be fair, it's made by, you know, a Hollywood studio. Like, they they don't really make those kinds of movies that well. Let's be real. Let's I mean, be they don't. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, despite that, there are things I really like about this movie. I think the gore, first of all, is pretty good. It's um, as awesome, especially that it, ambulance scene. Oh my god the the hospital van scene was fantastic. The hospital van scene. Yeah, shout out to Xander, hospital <laughs> van. But anyway, like, yeah, no, that's a great example of like, that's if that if that one hot that one ambulance scene. I almost said hospital van scene. If that one <laughs> ambulance scene, you know, if that was the kind of energy that every scene in this movie had, then it would be what it was always meant to be. But it's only like a couple of scenes here and there where you get the ambulance scene uh, level at, level of energy. You know, you get like the scene where they're at the, uh, fuck, I already forgot the name of it, but they, they like literally make a joke about it. The, the, the Pantheon fucking place. Uh, is it is that the, like the mountain or like or the place that the people are at in the first scene or which one, which one is that? The, the where they where the cop is like on the roof and he has like the duffel bag of coke. Oh yeah, that's right. They made a joke about the, the name of that place and I've already forgotten it. Whoa, this is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, uh, but like, but that's what I'm saying. Like that scene where like it's the scenes that were obviously made to get, get a reaction out of the audience. Like that's where the movie shines when it's trying to be like a legit, uh, dra drama. Oh yeah. Th those, work. like those do not work. A especially towards the end. Like when you start getting into like the quote unquote climax of the movie, that's when the movie really does start to fall flat. It doesn't fall as flat as I was expecting. Like I was really expecting it to like, hit the ground hard, like flat on its nose, like Margot Mar Martindale being thrown out of the hospital van. But like, it doesn't like, it, it's not great. It does not reach the levels of insanity that the first half does, but you definitely do start to feel a bit of the uh, movie running dry on ideas by the end, especially when, you know, Ray Liotta comes in as like the, the, the villain of the movie it's like <laughs> like really they didn't even they, they barely even villain. set that up first of all like then like they yeah. have they have the whole scene uh near the end where he's like you're no son of mine to like the guy who plays han solo uh in yeah. the solo star wars story prequel that no one remembers yeah and like they have that kid the henry kid just be like hey man you're a bad father <laughs> it's like was that a lesson in this movie like <laughs> what is this? this is a cocaine bear movie like stop <laughs> stop trying to have a like, stop trying to have a lesson here. Just, like... That adds to the cheesiness, though, I think. I don't mind that stuff, though. But it's, yeah. like, it's when uh, some of this human drama stuff, though, like, is just when it kind of bogs down, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I'm not saying, like, you know, I don't want to sound like a, a average kaiju fan here. Where it's like, oh, the monster stuff is great. The human stuff sucks. But it's like, yeah, the human stuff is kind of what drags it down. Now, speaking of Han Solo, Alden Ehrenreich, holy shit, like, what a great actor. <laughs> like, he was awesome in this movie, I must say. Like, yeah, I mean, all the actors were good. His first scene where he's, like, crying into the pasta, I'm like, holy shit, like, why was this guy wasted in Solo? Like, give this man a long-lasting career, man. Like, he's going to be an Oppenheimer. So 
Yeah. Oh, he is in Oppenheimer. Oh, I can't wait for that. <laughs> Oppenheimer um, has like a huge cast. It has like freaking Emily Blunt and Cillian Murphy yeah. and just everyone's in it. Yeah, and famous Red Letter Media alum Jack Quaid. I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's going to be awesome. But anyway, but yeah, Alden Ehrenreich, like I was like uh, surprised at how good he was. I'm just like, wow, he's really good. I'm pissed that he was wasted in Solo. And, but I remember being good in Solo. It's just like get, put him in good movies. Put him in put him in more Cocaine Bear movies, please. <laughs> cocaine, cocaine Bear is a better Bear movie has, than Solo. Yeah, it is. It is. Let's I realized that the two movies we're discussing here, uh, I guess we'll talk about Brazil later, but this and Cocaine Bear – Secondly, they, they're 80s throwbacks, you know? Cocaine Bear, it's based yeah. on an incident that happened in 1985, which I think is the same year that Brazil came out, actually. Same year that Brazil? Wow, look at us. We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> Look at us with the unintentional coincidence. That's awesome. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, more things to talk about. I, honestly, like I'm kind of surprised. Uh, I mean, the gore in it was awesome. Uh, I love the scene near the end where, like, uh, where like Ray Liotta's death was so cool though, because like he yeah. was like getting ripped, his stomach was getting ripped apart. Spoilers by uh the bear, and like it turned out that the bear had like babies that were yeah, like eating bears. up his intestines and stuff like that. That was cool. Yeah, because the baby bears are high high on cocaine. It's yeah. just like yeah, it's like I that's like cruel, but like hilariously cruel and i wish the movie really doubled down on that and i feel like it kind of does because like it treats the bear eating cocaine as like a superpower and like you know there's literally that scene where like the bear gets shot it falls down a waterfall but then like it gets like it gets like a whiff more of cocaine and then it just like climbs back up and you're just like supposed to be cheering it on and you're just like yeah cocaine it's just like yeah there was a part of me that was kind of sad though and like even though this bear like just killed off a bunch of people in the movie like when it died and it's like uh it initially died and like the bear cubs were like all sad like oh like there's a part of me that felt kind of bad though because like you know because like yeah, they're just kids what- and and I remember I was listening to like a podcast recently that was talking about like that, how you're just like supposed to be rooting for the cocaine bear and how like weirdly tonally inconsistent that is. And it's like, yeah, but as me who is watching like such weird and stupid movies, like you, you are rooting for the monster, like deep down, you don't really care about the humans, but what this movie does. And that's why, like, you know, because it's made by like a Hollywood studio and, Hollywood doesn't understand these weirdo movies. They also want you to root for the humans. So like you have this weird uh, tonal uh, inconsistency with the movie. That's basically the movie's like biggest problem is the fact that it doesn't really know what it wants to be. Like, yeah. Is it is it trying to be a legit Hollywood uh, comedy? Is it trying to be like this weirdo horror monster movie like it's at odds with itself with with the tone and like i i mean it's not as bad when it comes to these inconsistencies with like other movies like it's it 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 has some sort of an understanding but it obviously i blame more more so the studio for like kind of holding it back than i do like the filmmakers actually trying to make something here yeah um I think, though, that I think it's kind of weird, though, because like in case you didn't know, like the real life incident that this movie's based on, like apparently because like the bear in real life that ingested a bunch of cocaine, I think never killed anyone and just died of an overdose like 20 minutes afterwards, I think. So oh, there, yeah. there's no the, the, rampage or the, anything. Yeah, no, the original story that this is based off of is horribly, horribly depressing, just like this random bear ingests cocaine and then overdoses and dies. And then like you know, people are trying to pretend and make a spectacle out of it in this movie. And I, and I get it. Like, you're not going to actually base it off the actual true events because again, a bear overdosing on cocaine is horribly depressing. Like you're going to just stretch the truth here and just make it into like a fun, stupid horror movie. And it's like, I get that. Um, And at first I was a little scared because I did actually read the original uh, story this is based off of when the first trailer came out and I'm like oh my god this is kind of gross but like when you actually watch the movie it's like all right th- this was never really trying to be anything that you know serious 
is serious, exactly. So I don't think it's serious. trying to, uh, it's not really trying to basically kind of uh, cap, I mean, it is kind of capitalizing off of like the phenomenon, but it's not really trying to, uh, you know, I guess it's not really, you know, it's not really disrespecting the bear in real life or anything, I don't think. It would have been kind of weird if they killed off the bear at the end and like they had that whole like in memory of the real life bear or something like that. I guess that's why there wasn't any in in memory of the bear that ingested cocaine in real life, but they had yeah. one for Ray Liotta. I mean, they had to because well, Ray Liotta was actually did die, but like mm-hmm. also, yeah, the bear the bear did actually die. You know, it's one of those weird things. Like, I where do you draw the line then uh, with that kind of stuff? But I mean whatever it's it, it, it's weird you know like i did have fun in the theater the theater was laughing along at this movie and i did you know well, i was impressed with a lot of what it did but at the same time you know it's one of those things where i'm just like i really can't uh say it wowed me in any way like it didn't wow it didn't wow me to the extent that I probably would have wanted it to wow me is the mm-hmm. thing. I mean, there are a lot of great scenes that I'd gladly watch again and again, though. So, like, sure. um, you know, and the whole movie as a whole isn't, like, perfect or anything. But as, like, I'm glad it's, like, only 90, around 90 minutes long. Because, like, a lot of that movies now, a lot of yeah. movies now feel like need to be, like, two hours, two and a half hours. They're just stretching, like, their thin premise or whatever. Even that, there's this movie I saw series. recently. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, or they got to be mini series like the Disney Plus Marvel shows. They're oh, yeah. Just like, oh, we got to stretch this out to six episodes. It's like, you really didn't need to do that. Even that movie I saw yesterday uh, as we're recording this, like I saw 65 with Adam Driver and it was like, it was 94, 93 minutes long. But like, it felt like it was stretching out this whole premise of like Adam Driver just shooting these dinosaurs for as long as it could when honestly it just would have been better it's like a 20 minute short or something like that yeah it's one of those things where like you 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 think of this really neat idea that you'd want to see as a movie then it actually goes through the studio process and then by the end you're just like oh wow this was not nearly as funny as i thought it would be um which is a shame it's a shame i mean i feel like this movie is kind of a victim of that uh mindset like you're just like what if there was a movie about a bear high on cocaine and then you know what goes through the studio process and it comes out like this admittedly not as bad as i was expecting but i don't know it's not there it's not the levels that i kind of wish it would be you know it's one of the better reddit movies though well you know what that's a very good point this is a very this is very much a reddit movie but like you, you're absolutely right. This is definitely one of the better ones. Because uh, I remember you said all, about Unbearable Weight, though, like, you know, it's not great or anything, but it's one of the better Reddit movies because it's less cringe and, you know, it'll be less dated in years to come, I guess. I think Cocaine Bear will be less dated. Yeah, yeah I think so, too. That's that. I, I think that's already pretty dated because I literally have not watched it since then. And I don't remember anything about it, but just remember this Nick Cage movie. But like, <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, I feel like Cocaine Bear, I th- I think it'll have its place in cinematic history for better or for worse. Again, I, I feel like I'm shitting on this movie and in a way I am, but like it- Because you I wanted really better. Was, I did want better, but I'm not like super disappointed by it either. Like I feel like with like movies in the past couple of years, there are movies that have like absolutely angered me from how disappointing I found them. Whereas like this- it's I'm a little disappointed, but like at the same time, I got the ambulance scene. I got the uh, uh, scene where like the kid gets his head blown off. Uh, I got the, like the different uh, amounts of gore in this movie. Like th- there's things to appreciate in this movie, mostly yeah. the ambulance scene. But at the same time, just there there is stuff to appreciate. And honestly, if there's one or two things to appreciate that's more than i was expecting so you know what good on the movie i love i thought the visual effects for the bear were actually pretty good too i will say they were obviously cgi yeah but i have seen worse so you know what yeah i i didn't mind it it was not that distracting to me 
there were shots that looked really good though i think of the the lighting on the bear and stuff like that i think yeah. looked pretty impressive especially for it's like 35 million dollar budget yeah that's true that's true i think i think this movie will be a big hit 35 million how much has it been making at the box office i think uh it made 23 million in its opening i think it's making like it's probably aiming to make like 72 million domestically uh okay. and it's run so it's not it's not making star wars numbers but you know no it's not making <laughs> well to be fair han solo the actor for han solo was in this movie and solo kind of flopped so yeah solo didn't make star wars money but like it didn't really deserve to yeah but yeah you know what uh, i think even though even if it won't make like gangbusters i think it'll find its uh audience i i, I think it'll find i mean it has found its audience people are talking about it but like I don't think this movie's going to go away necessarily. I don't know if it'll necessarily be like a a cult hit in the coming year. I mean, it probably won't because it will probably make money. So like, you know, cult hits never really make money in, in their first round. But I think a fan base will uh, persist over the years is my prediction. Yeah, least. I'd say so. I don't think I don't see this becoming like a classic in the sense that it's going to win everyone over. But I see it. No. It's it's it has it's going to find it's some like kind of longevity in the in its long run I think yeah and when it comes to movies that like uh, have some sort of longevity in the past couple of years I wouldn't be mad if this one did like if it found a fan base like I I would not be mad at that there's other movies I would be mad if they found like a long lasting fan base but this this one I would not be mad at. Definitely one of the, probably I've ranked it technically right now as like the best movie I've seen this year, but uh, you know I've only seen like four movies this year, so you know mm-hmm. I've seen one movie this year <laughs> and it is the best and the worst so far. It was better than Megan, though I will say that. Yeah, I still have not seen Mithrigan. Maybe Mithrigan. Oh, I forgot to call it that. No, that's fine. I'm sure lots of people have. Um. All right, was there anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up our cocaine bear discussion? Oh, I like the part at the end where uh, the Han Solo, uh, I keep calling him Han Solo, but the Alden, I, mean, uh, Ac- well. I can't pronounce Alden, like, uh, guess like Aaron Reich. Alden Ehrenreich, uh, <laughs> I can't pronounce it. But, you know, I, I like the part at the end where like, because it's established earlier on in the movie like that this police officer character is given this like cute little like doggy or something like that. And then at the end, like, uh, because I think that Alden's character is so depressed throughout most of the movie and that I think at the end, he's given the little the little female dog at the end. Like it's his support animal. That was cute. Yeah, that was wholesome. Again, though, like in a movie like titled Cocaine Bear, that's just promising, like just blood and guts and stuff like that. It's like wholesome. I don't really want my uh, stupid horror movie, but whatever like yeah i admit it was very wholesome i I had a smile on my face because only alden aaron wright could uh perform that i guess it definitely was not as bad as it could have been but it was not as good as it could have been though exactly i'm glad it wasn't a disaster yeah i think if that ambulance scene wasn't in it it i would most definitely give this a five out of ten but that ambulance scene definitely bumped it up so god bless the hospital van scene I give it a seven, mostly because the scenes in it that are that are good are really good, and uh, I'd say that most of it's really enjoyable. I'd just say like the first twenty minutes are kind of bland or whatever, but I really liked it yeah. overall. I'd watch it again. Mm, okay, would you own it on physical media? Maybe. Okay. Do you have much of a physical media collection? Oh, I do. Yeah, I, I've started collecting ever since like twenty 2020 twenty or twenty nineteen. So yeah, I have a nice. bunch of most of my favorite movies I have on Blu Ray or criterion i'm starting i'm starting to collect 4k right now because i just got a 4k tv and a and a player so yeah so yeah that's usually how i like to round off our discussions on the movies is like would you keep this in your collection and would i keep it in my collection and um i feel like the more i'm talking about it the less likely i am to buy it on blu-ray but i don't know i can't really say it wouldn't be welcome in my collection. I'm just, it's not one I want to like go out the second it comes out on 4k or regular Blu-ray that I want to get it in. Uh, I want to get it. Like, I think I, I, if anything, I'll take my time. Um, 
if it ever does get make its way into my collection. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'd buy it on Blu-ray just so just to put on for part just to put on for people at parties. I think. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> a good party movie. Oh, I gotta make a list of what I would put on at parties. Maybe CIA. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and just invite some people over and just watch the yeah, ape. The Little Mermaid 3, Ariel's Beginning, I'd show at parties. Yeah. If you ever want anyone to leave at a party, you put on Belle's Magical World. Ooh, that'd be a good idea. Yeah, nobody would want to sit through that. <laughs> Not even me. Or Tarzan and Jane. I'd put on Tarzan and Jane and they'd be out of there. They'd be out of there in like the first 10 minutes. Yeah. I, I'd even leave my own house if I put on Tarzan and Jane. <laughs> Or put on Marmaduke 2010. That's how you get everyone to, uh, you know, stay at the party. Oh, that's true. That's when you get people to stay. If you want people to leave, you put on Marmaduke 2022. And you put on the specific scene where he shits in a trophy. Uh, <laughs> that's how you get people to leave. Imagine, like, you're at a party and, like, Marmaduke 2010's on. And everyone's doing it. Everyone, all the dogs are doing, the, like, the doggy dance at the end. And everyone at the party starts doing it. <laughs> Oh, that'd be so cursed. Uh, <laughs> so cursed. Hey, well, speaking of cursed, um, we watched a movie that also uh, may contain some cursed aspects to it. Maybe some cursed imagery, if you will, I think is what the kids would say. Because uh, there is a lot of dark imagery in Brazil. You know, I, I'd probably say that sounds about right, wouldn't you say? It would. It's called the smile. The smiling friends go to Brazil, directed by Terry Gilligan. Ooh, very nice. You rounded it off to you related it to smiling friends. I, you know what? I probably would have done that if I was smart enough. But me, me, not smart. But yeah. Anyway, we watched Brazil, not to be confused with that country that Rio takes place in. No, a movie called Brazil by director Terry Gilliam. Uh, it's really only called Brazil me. because of the. Uh, the song at the opening but is that why it's called brazil i think so i think that's the only reason because i don't it doesn't obviously does not take place in brazil and uh the opening song is just named after brazil i think because it started brazil i don't know i don't know the lyrics but yeah no i if that's the only reason that's interesting i didn't know that uh but yeah brazil noted for being uh the nostalgia critics favorite movie ever yep which... the the reviewer we've memed on <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Which is really interesting now that I think about it. It's like, wow, Brazil's your favorite movie. I mean, I you can kind of see it in his style and personality a little bit. The yeah, kind of bonkers, you know, fast paced. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what? Yeah, now that I think about it, that's true. Um, but yeah, Lazy, what'd you think of Brazil? Okay, so this is my second time watching this movie. Well, I guess technically I watched it three times if you want to cut the, uh, if you want to call, if you want to uh count the uh the love conquers all cut that we watched as well because we watched there's three versions of this movie there's the director's cut there's the theatrical and there's the love conquers all tv cut that's only 94 minutes long okay so there's a difference between the two okay i didn't know there was three different cuts i know so i so uh so let me just say so i own this on a criterion dvd from 1999. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, so it's like a three disc uh, set. This uh, Criterion, and it's and because it's from 1999, and even though it advertises itself as widescreen, it's technically not. It's widescreen, but for four by three TVs that were made in 1999, and not sixteen by nine TVs that most everybody has nowadays. So. Well, I was watching this movie on my 16 by 9 TV, uh, you know. Had the black the, bars? The black bars. It was just surrounded by black bars. Uh, it was it was a little distracting, um, but it was still kind of neat seeing, like, you know, the old aesthetic of 1999 uh, DVD menus. But anyway, uh, so this uh, specific DVD that I have of Brazil, so it comes with the uh what is described as like so so it's the director's cut um or the final cut is how it's described which is the 
it like takes aspects of okay so it gathers footage from both the european and american versions so so that would be the director's cut correct i think so yeah the director's okay. cut is the is the longest one it's like 142 minutes long so okay that's the version i watched first me too yeah so okay so but that's not like the theatrical cut i think the theatrical cut is like 10 minutes shorter okay so, and the TV so the cut, versions, the, yeah, it's very the complicated. Not, yeah, so so the versions I have seen are the final cut and the Love Conquers All cut. So I have not Same. seen the theatrical cut, which I'm assuming the theatrical cut is the version that, uh, well, it doesn't come with this. So like, I'm just wondering like how legit that version would be. I don't know what the difference are, differences are between that and the director's cut, though. I know the, yeah. the Love Conquers All cut, it's obviously just like, Pretty, pretty much just ripped out a bunch of scenes from the uh, director's cut, obviously. But yeah, so so I have seen the, so the the final cut is the version I would say is probably the most uh, accurate to what Gilliam wants out of the movie. In which yep. case, I loved it a lot. It was bonkers and insane and crude, a little messy, I will say, in some aspects, but like. Not in a way, like it, it comes together in the end a little messy, but in a way where I'm just like, okay, this kind of rocks, you know? Same. It, you know, it's, it, this is everything I could have ever wanted out of a movie, is what I said in like my initial uh, review on Letterboxd. And what I mean by that is like the visuals are just fantastic. The story is just really compelling in a way that like, it's pretty relatable to begin with. It gets a little weird towards the end, but then like, you know, then it starts kind of encompassing a lot of uh, crazy symbolic energy to it. And like, it just throws a lot of stuff at the wall. And depending on your movie, that can either annoy or engage me. In this case, it really engaged me. Yeah. Uh, just because of the way it like, just, just because of the way it's like tackling a lot of these issues. And and obviously, like like I said, the visuals, like the visuals are what really grab me for this movie. I freaking love the aesthetics that this movie throws at you. Oh, yeah. It's Especially the dream pure, sequences. Yeah. Dream sequences are fantastic. They're purely 80s. A lot of it reminded me of the Dark Crystal as a huge Dark Crystal fan. So that was really cool seeing. And again, because of the, like the story being so weird... They really just it it really they really complement each other. I must say the story is definitely like down to earth enough to like where like we as the audience are able to relate to like the main character Sam Blarry. Oh uh, my god! So there's this there's this scene at the beginning when like he's it's the scene where he gets up for the first time like he's like waking up and he's like going through his motions and like there's that scene, and so like he's like you know going going around his apartment getting ready for work. And the TV's on, and he's like always has his like eyes glued to the TV as he's like like fixing stuff and like doing stuff, like making breakfast and stuff like that. And it's like, holy shit, like that really cut me to the core because like every time I'm like getting ready for work in the morning, I always have like my phone, like I'm playing like an Oni Plays playthrough Let's Play on YouTube, and I'm like have my phone, my eyes to glued to my phone, and I'm just like, oh god. But like it, it, it's not like a one to one. But like I, I completely understood in that moment. I'm just like, oh shit! Like I'm being called out here. Like, oh, uh. it was. Like, it, uh, he just like me for real, for real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like it's done in so in a way that I'm just like, oh, that's brilliant. And just like the every t like there's that there's like all those that scene where like uh, oh, what's her face? Jill is like at the police headquarters or whatever and like she has like all these cameras like going in her face and it's just like oh god and like every once every once in a while there's an explosion and a terrorist attack and people are just like kind of indifferent to it after a while and you're just like <laughs> oh how relevant but like in a smart way i feel like that's one of those things where like you could absolutely screw up that kind of uh subplot in a movie or like that those kinds of themes in a movie like you could absolutely screw that up in a way that like you come across as either pretentious or uh what's the word i'm thinking of? Uh, on the nose 
on the nose like yeah like you you come across as just like kind of shitty in that sense and you're just like uh i'm being talked down to but this movie never feels like it's talking down to you like it does these things in such a clever way and it's it's brilliant i love the scenes of like when he's up in uh when he's up when he gets promoted and he meets uh what's his name mr mr warren and he's and mr warren's just like running around like with all these people behind (laughs) him he's like yes no yes no yes no oh my god it's brilliant it's so funny but like so clever it's basically kind of like a more a kind of a more funny comedic like take on something like blade runner where that's like a depiction of like a of a a dystopian future you know but it's like a way of putting it it is a much funnier blade runner like and i love blade runner like so much so yeah. that's one of my favorites too I, yeah it's one of my favorites but like you know blade runner is obviously a lot more slow a lot more serious this yeah this is definitely blade runner but funny uh that's oh that's a good way of putting it i didn't even think about it that way but yeah that's brilliant uh i guess maybe to like kind of pull it back a little let me talk about something i'm not a fan of and that is uh <sighs> And this is probably the reason I haven't given it like the full five stars. I feel like if this movie tweaked this aspect a little better, I would probably give it the full five stars or maybe it's something that'll grow on me and then I'll eventually give it five stars. But the reason I gave it four and a half is like, I'm not so much a fan of the romance aspect of this movie. I I don't know. What what did you think? Yeah. um, I mean, like, I guess like it's a bit more interesting than your average romance, I guess, because like, you know, the when Sam eventually meets like uh, his love interest that he's been dreaming of, like for like for most of the movie beforehand, before he, before he meets her, you know, I think it's, I mean, like she kind of is more indifferent and like, (laughs) there's even a point where like she kicks him out of the truck that she's, that he's, that she's driving. And I think that's pretty funny. Uh, I mean, like, I think like, I do kind of think that maybe the romance could have been fleshed out a little bit better because you only really get to know them for like, maybe like, like the last quarter of the movie before, you know, they fall in love and everything. Yeah. So the, that scene where she kicks him out, I love that scene. Like where especially he's just like, where he's like uh, confessing to her and she's just like, oh, you're just like my type. And he's like, I don't believe you. And she's like, why? He's like, because I don't re- deserve such tremendous luck. It's like, oh, I love that. That's a great scene. I love that that's in the movie. Like, because, yeah, you never see that in any movie like this. Or like you never see that in any movie. Like, it's just such a great back and forth. I love that. Yeah. A lot of great comedic but... scenes with the, uh, you know, especially like the opening scene uh, where like the the troops are like arresting this guy they confuse for, uh, you know, Robert De Niro's character because he's basically like do- doing like activity that's considered illegal. And so like when uh, this wife is getting like her husband like arrested uh, and then like they, they basically sack him. And they take him away, and like they and they go up to her and say, "By the way, sign this here, here, here." <laughs> you know, yeah, I think she that's goes funny. Along with it, she's actually like signing it. It's <laughs> like, yeah, that that's what kind of like that dark humor I love about this movie. Yeah, totally. Um, but my original point uh, about the romance, it's like, yeah, I think, and to add to that dark comedy, like that scene where he's just like, "I don't deserve such tremendous luck." Like that's funny, but I don't know. It's the fact that he's like so obsessive with her and i I guess it's funny you said that this is like blade runner but funny because like another like a aspect of blade runner i don't like is the romance um you know just how like kind of sudden and weird it is um which i do have a bit of a uh defense for it in a sense it's like okay maybe the reason he's so weird about it is because well he's a weirdo he's a lone loner like and so when he actually sees this woman who he thinks is the woman in his dreams, he doesn't really know how to interact with people. So like, of course, he's going to be like kind of weird around her. And like, yeah, it is this weird thing that he's saying, like, oh, you're you're, you're in my dream. My dream. Yeah, exactly. I it's love like, you. No, I mean, in my dreams. Yeah. So in that sense, I'm OK with that because it's like, OK, you're a weirdo. But I don't know. I guess it's the fact that like the movie still treats her as like okay with it after a while like you know because later on they do become like a couple's quote unquote now to be fair maybe 
that's more so the fact that like the reason they become a couple later on is because they don't actually like maybe this is all in sam's head you know because like obviously towards the end it's all in sam's head yeah like especially like the the climax you know how the robert de niro's character is like rescuing yeah, him rescuing him and then like you know it's revealed it's like oh it was all in his head and it's just like he's totally lobotomized by the end he's totally just gone and it's like okay maybe maybe even before that he was long gone like maybe a lot of this movie is just in his head like it's all just like because then it just kind of it's just like the downfall of this guy just like being trapped in this situation and he's just like imagining all this stuff and like he just completely loses it by the end so like you know to say that like the before he completely loses it is like 100 percent accurate maybe that's not entirely true maybe like the whole movie this whole time has just been kind of weird and out there and not entirely 100 percent grounded in reality in which case i'm okay with that then like that a couple episodes ago i was just talking about the shining and how like i love that that movie's not 100 percent grounded so if that's the case with brazil holy shit like i freaking love this movie a lot more then you know yeah i mean it, it kind of does make sense like the ending especially when you like look at it from the other like chunk of the film yeah so i will say like the first so like as the climax went along i was just like oh this is getting weirder and weirder and like the back of my head i'm like god i hope they really bring it back in like they really bring it back at the very end and of course you know there's that scene where like it's they're going into the sunset and it, like pans out and then like michael palin and uh mr Heltman like just kind of like show up like in that image and then they're just like oh he's gone and then like it just ends on him just like uh humming some song as like the credits roll it's like oh mwah, perfect perfect ending i love it god like and that's when i'm just like okay maybe the whole movie was not 100 percent realistic in which case brilliant like i love it then a lot more and i need to watch it again <laughs> you know yeah i love that there's two tones to this movie like there's the uh yeah of course they're depicting like this kind of cynical like uh you know you know capitalist society and in the middle of it like again we've mentioned that sam like often like dreams this kind of fantasy reality where he has to save this lady that he dreams of uh you know a lot and like he has a sword and he can fly and stuff like that and like mm -hmm. yeah so like there's definitely you know it's kind of almost like a way of like him escaping like the kind of nihilistic uh world that he has to live in yeah i that's what i appreciate about this movie it's nihilistic and uh depressing but like it is also really funny yeah like, it has a sense of humor to it and i appreciate that i i like that it's like kind of you'd think like you know this like depressing outlook and with a bit of comedy would be like clashing tone wise but like it actually works like it, it, it works really well in a way that it separates itself from like your typical dystopian uh movie like i i like that it's yeah it's so good. I feel like there's just so much I could talk about with this movie, but it's almost perfect for me. It's yeah, it is. I'm sure if I watch it again, uh, I'll realize it is perfect for me. Like I honestly, like I'm glad we chose this movie. Cause like, I've always wanted to see it. And obviously the first time I watched it much like any other movie, like I'm just like, Oh, that was weird. But then as you start to think about what it's attempting, then you start to appreciate more and more. Yeah, I think like I remember the first time I watched this movie, like I think it was like three years ago or something like that. I think I, I would have been a little younger. So I like I, I, like a lot of what the movie was going for kind of went over my head. But now that I've rewatched it, I'm like really went over by its really unique world. And like just a lot of the great themes and elements of it are just in the way it kind of depicts this like dystopian future, but in a way that is completely different from everything else, every other piece of, piece of media that does so. Yeah, like you said, it is very similar to Blade Runner, but again, it it's funny. Like it has a sense of humor to it, whereas Blade Runner didn't. Now, obviously, I can't really say which I would rather prefer because it's been a couple of years since I've seen Blade Runner and Brazil. I literally just watched within the past couple of days, so like it's kind of hard to say. But I think both are going for different things, though, too, because and, yeah. and also to, both are going for different things. So it is unfair to kind of pit 
them against each other. But they're kind of like different, uh, you know, apples and oranges, but, you know. Exactly. But I think, but you know, Blade it, Runner. interesting to think about. Yeah, Blade Runner is kind of like sort of a neo-noir film, I think, more so mm-hmm. than like Brazil is in that. I'd say it's kind of similar to Chinatown in a sense, you know, but in a sci-fi setting. Yeah, yeah that's a good way of putting it, I would say. Um, so uh, I want kind of I want to kind of move on to talking about the Love Conquers All cut, if you don't mind. Yeah. So you and you watched it, correct? Mm-hmm. I did last okay. night, and uh, it was yeah, it was too. not as uh, good as the, the director's cut. So, so here's the weird thing. So, in a sense, it feels like the exact same movie barring you know the first scene and the last scene but like it doesn't feel genuine like it feels like the first movie but like not genuine it's really interesting actually so like obviously it starts off really weirdly actually so it starts off kind of similarly where like you know it has uh uh the guy the the guy in like the computer at the computer writing down that like Tuttle's being arrested and then like the fly drops into the typewriter and it malfunctions and it instead says buttle now. Uh, but then like, there's a, no, wait. So that's the intro in like the original version. But then like in this version, that's after the title drop. What actually happens is like in the, the opening. So there's that opening where like it zooms out of like that TV uh, store and like there's that advertisement for the, du- the heating ducts, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and so in the original, it just explodes. But like in this one, it zooms out. Then it cuts to the dinner scene with uh, Sam. The waiter saying mother. bon appetit. Yeah, bon appetit. And then and then that and then that scene has like a terrorist explosion. And then it cuts to the Brazil title. It's so confusing, is, especially like if you haven't seen the original version or the director's version. Yeah, it's so out of place and so edited poorly it's just like who thought this was a good idea like especially maybe, since the dinner scene isn't even in the movie uh the yeah. director i mean the tv cut yeah and the tv cut it's like who okayed that like it just doesn't it, it like and how does that apply anything to the movie like that's what i'm just kind of wondering it just it feels broken like it feels like a mistake but apparently it was aired in tvs like that it was weird okay And then, like, the rest of the movie, you're, like, watching it. But you feel this, like, kind of sense of, like, I don't think the producers who okayed this version even get what they're watching. Like, I don't think they get it, you know? I felt like it was speeding through the whole thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, oh, my God. Speeding is, like, a good way of putting it. Like, it's just, like, snip, snip, snip. Like, you're just, like, going through the motions. But, like, you know, you're still getting the same lines, more or less. But, like, you're not getting the same impact. It's also a good uh, indication of how... uh, it's not always about what story you tell, but how you tell it. Exactly, exactly. Like, I, I made a joke in my letterbox review for the Love Conquers All version where, like, it's like that scene in that Simpsons episode of where they where Milhouse runs away from the radioactive man set, and they're just like, thanks to modern editing techniques, we can finish the film without Milhouse. And, like, they make, like, this incomprehensible garbage that's, like, sort of weird, and then, like, the editor gets fired, and that's the joke. But, like... But that's what this move that's what this version of the movie feels like. Like that, but unironically. But also, they didn't miss anything. Like they had all the elements on how to make the movie good. They just chose to not include them and to make it worse. So you're like, why would you do that? <laughs> like, what yeah. sense does that make? And then and then you get to the ending and the They have the happy, happy ending. ending happy happy joy joy which was really funny so the happy ending is literally just the obviously the scene so in the original cut it's when michael palin gets shot and then robert de niro comes swooping in to save him it's like okay that's so obviously the dream sequence after you realize that it was a dream sequence but in this movie it's taken literally (laughs) and it's really funny so like they but they still include the scene of robert de niro like disappearing in the pile of papers but then it cuts to him with jill because like that's the scene when like he's with jill in the truck 
but like what sense does that make because like it literally just cuts from him like searching for robert de niro in the papers to then him with jill in the truck and then it cuts to them in that countryside with the truck and there's that scene where she like walks into the house and she like looks over and it's supposed to be him like sleeping but it's so obviously the scene from the opening when he wakes up in the house like it's it's literally just that but like freeze framed on that which is really funny like i don't know if you caught that i didn't catch that actually yeah no it's so obviously just a screenshot of the opening scene of him like waking up in his original apartment but like they they literally play it off as like oh he's in the house asleep it's like it to bring up the simpsons again it's literally like that scene from uh homer badman where like he is like getting interviewed and they like edit the interview to make him seem like a monster and like they literally have like a screenshot of him like uh, just they use like a screenshot of him in that interview it's it's literally just a simpsons joke but for real like unironically it's fascinating that these people did that it's so funny i think i kind of remember it now that you mentioned it like i mean it kind of like the whole ending miss missed the point of the original yeah so not only and, and obviously i was expecting that because it's like oh you're using the happy ending you misunderstand but even beyond it misunderstanding the the original ending this happy ending is edited so poorly that you're just like this is a joke right like you're not actually trying like this is so obviously edited so poorly and this is so obviously not the intended ending, but like, you know, you'd think you would actually edit something funny or happy. Like you would actually edit it in a way where it makes sense. Like it's not even edited in a way that makes sense. It's literally just the happy, it's mind boggling. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going insane just trying to even like rationalize like what it is, what it's actually trying to do. Like I probably sound like a madman trying to <laughs> describe this, but like it's literally blowing my mind. Like you, you know how the little shop of horrors, the original. Oh yeah. Like there's like, like the that. happy ending and there's like the, yeah. And then there's the happy ending, but like I've only ever seen the happy ending of little shop of horrors. I've only seen like, the dark ending actually interesting like yeah no i've always wanted to see the dark ending but like i've only ever seen the happy ending of little shop of horrors but like even though i know it's a fake ending and like you know i'm feeling cheated it's still edited in a way that seems like it makes sense like it doesn't seem broken like the the happy ending of little shop of horrors actually feels like it fits within the movie like i know it's not the true ending that frank oz wanted but like it doesn't feel that half-assed. Like, it actually feels like a genuine ending to the story. It's just not the intended ending to the story. It feels like, it just feels like they half-assed the ending to, like, the TV cut where, like, yeah. you know, they, they just gathered all the footage they could and just threw it at the, at the monitor. It's mind-blowing. It's like, how could anybody watch this on TV and, like, feel like they're getting, like, an actual finished product? Like, it feels broken. It's just, like, it's hilarious. It's so funny. And like, oh my God, I love the way that uh, the Criterion DVD describes it. They're just like... They wanted uh, it to become more commercial. Yeah, more commercial. But, but they're like, making it I more confusing. But, but like, it, it just blows my mind because it's like no person is going to watch this. And like, I feel like even the most general of audience members would be would feel like something is off by this ending. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's like, it's... Anyway, I, I love the way that like uh, Criterion, like the Criterion DVD describes this. So they're just like, in the hope of making the film commercial, stands as a fascinating document of the power of editing to change a picture. Everything is different in this. The only Brazil not cut by Terry Gilliam, sometimes known as the syndicated television version, and includes all the outs and all the cuts and changes Gilliam refused to make, from the alternate ending to the infamous happy ending from the alternate opening to the infamous happy ending. I love how it's like trying to put a positive spin on this. Like they're just like, Oh, the power of editing can change a film. It's like, Oh my God, you're holding back your laughter from just saying like, this sucks. Like, <laughs> and it does like the love conquers all cut. Like what a fascinating, just piece of garbage it is. It's so, I kind of love it just from how broken it is. The only know? thing I really got out of the TV cut is it kind of, like I was rewatching some scenes of it uh, because some of it is kind of uh, the same as the original, but just sped up, yeah. you know, yeah, but exactly. uh, 
especially like that one scene where like uh like if i can't like that whole scene where like he's going back to like the mo- the 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 wife of mr buttle that was like taken away and like uh the way and like the whole the way the scene goes goes about is just so confusing even for someone like me that saw the director's cut like they just mm-hmm. like all of a sudden he just sees that vision of uh, the girl in his dreams and like a reflect a mirror reflection but like it just feels like it comes out of nowhere like wh- yeah. where did that come from yeah exactly and then like like cuts back to like the the or, or no i think that's a different scene where he sees jill for the first time and like but like it cuts to like his dream sequence even though the dream sequence happened like 30 seconds before so because like you know the movie thinks you're an idiot for not remembering that it's like i remember i'm not an, i'm not a moron it took out a lot of the dream sequences, except for the first yeah. one. Well, yeah, the first. So the first one, which also to uh, make sure you know it's a dream sequence. So in the original cut, it literally just when like uh, Ian Holmes' character is just like, "Where's Mister Lowry?" There's like you know, it cuts to him like gliding in the sky, and then uh, as time goes on, then it like fades out, and then it's like, "Oh, it was a dream sequence." But like in this movie. In the love Con- in the love conquers all cut, it's like where's Mr. Lowry? It cuts to him asleep, and then it like fades into the dream sequence. And that's way worse. Beca- and because the movie thinks you're an idiot, it puts like a dream filter over the dream, and it's like okay. I noticed that. It like it had the white uh, like, things yeah. over it, and you can barely see what's going on because the dream filter is like so overpowering. It's like okay, I get it. It's a dream. Like I got that within when watching the first when watching the original cut like i got that like but it's oh god Ugh. yeah i get it you i get it movie i get it love conquers all you think i'm an idiot oh it's just oh also if you're trying to cut down the uh cut down the runtime just to have it on syndicated television then why are you adding that one clip of him like sleeping right before the dream sequence anyway it's oh my god oh so bizarre I, it's uh <laughs> it reminds me of the it's, uh it's i haven't seen the theatrical cut of blade runner but the way yeah, they have, have that ending where like he's just going on a vacation or something like yeah, that it, it feels like a freaking parody yeah. like what the hell are you thinking i hear that original theatrical cut like you know cause, like during the credits it uses like unused scenes from like the shining like a oh film i heard of that shot. yeah and it's like how out of place because blade runner and the shining two movies i love wholeheartedly but like different visually like that would just seem out of place that's so strange to me uh great directors getting their movies butchered by studios yeah god it's but it's fascinating like i kind of love that like it just it's i kind of love that this movie like this version of the movie is so shit just because it understands nothing of what made the original so good It, it made me really appreciate the original even though i love the original already i i love that this movie so much now just talking through it and like just analyzing everything about it it gets uh, better the more i think about it too yeah there's just so much i i love the the scene um when he's talking to michael palin for the first time and he's like give my best to allison and the twins and he says and michael palin goes triplets and sam just goes triplets wow how time flies it's like <laughs> that's that's so funny and like it's in the love conquers all cut and it's still funny like that's what i love about the love conquers all cut even though there are so many baffling mistakes like some scenes still like make it through like the terribleness like they still shine because terry gilliam is just so funny and so talented i mean he's from monty python so yeah exactly. i love love monty python i do too i do too i I watched 12 monkeys the other day which was another terry gilliam film about like kind of depicting us and I know you talked about it on the podcast before. I did, yes. Uh, but, you know, Very it was kind movie. of a, another kind of dystopian depiction of, you know, uh, the future and stuff like that. But I think I like Brazil more. I think it I think it has more to say with what, with its dystopian futuristic setting, I think. Yeah. I think it's honestly, like saying more with uh, its themes and stuff like that. Yeah, honestly, I might be there with you. I think I think I prefer Brazil too. Like I honestly think I could probably give this the full five stars the next time I see it. I'm like Same. I love this movie. Holy shit. Like the, not since the thing have I watched a movie and automatically just like fallen in love with it just so quickly. Like it's oh, it's so good. I I guess the I'm only so, problem I'm I had so- with it was 
I guess maybe the ending was a little too back and forth for me. I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird well, so like that. Which, so I, are we talking about the... Uh, no, like the the, the, uh, the director's cut ending. Like, yeah, the director's cut. I mean, like, it's okay, definitely so. like much better than the TV cut ending. But I, was, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it was just kind of weirded by, like, him, like, getting arrested. But then, like, he's rescued by, uh, you know, Robert De Niro's character. And then happy ending. But then it cuts back to him. You know, I, I get I get the point of it. Maybe it was just, mm-hmm. like... Maybe it was like it went it went on for longer than it should have. Maybe I'm just kind of nitpicking though. Yeah, no, I can kind of see that. I think that's where the genius of it comes in. It's yeah, like it's really like pushing like the sappiness as it goes along, and then to the point that like the and then like the reveal of Michael Palin and Mr. Heldman just like you know coming into frame, and you're just like, oh, that it's mask like, that um, Michael Palin was wearing, right? Wasn't that the baby mask. in the uh, the baby mask? Wasn't that in the like, the dream sequences he was having too? Yeah, that's like the, like the skexy like creatures that are just like you know covered in cloth, yeah. and then they have like the baby masks. It's like yeah, that's that yes, that is from his dream sequences. Which like it's like okay, how did Michael Palin like how did he know about that mask before? having the dream sequences like because like he had the dream sequences and then like then then michael palin has the mask so it's just kind of weird that like you know but though he saw that lady in his dream before he saw her in real life well that's the other thing it's like okay how did he know that this woman existed before meeting her it was all premonition it's all a premonition maybe again this movie's not 100 percent realistic narratively maybe like you know it is kind of all it's it's told in a dreamlike sense in which case honestly I'm okay with that. Like I've said with like The Shining, I like that this movie would not be 100% realistic. Like g- give me that uh semi quasi narrative with like, you know, symbolism and stuff like that. But as I've said that again, it it really depends on how you attempt with that kind of stuff, that kind of storytelling. And I really think this movie does that much better than something like I don't know, I can't really think of anything bad that i haven't liked that did that but you you know what i'm trying to say yeah. right i mean i mean i think this is definitely one of the best movies of its time like in terms of like the oh 80s God, dark yeah. fantasy because like we had yeah, we had like again dark, dark crystal labyrinth i think was yeah you know one of them yeah a lot a lot it's, of movies of this time i know fantasy was really popular in the 80s so this yeah kind of seemed like uh you know destined to come out around that time yeah, I think it's I think it's weird to kind of put this in the same boat as Labyrinth and Dark Crystal, but in a way it is, you know, because it is 80s dark fantasy. And as a massive Dark Crystal fan, yeah, I love Brazil. And I love that I love that Brazil has that extra layer of like, you know, theming to it. Like it actually has something to say. You know, it's not just like bureaucracy bad. Like, yeah, it is basically that. No, no, I'm not I'm so, I was trying to say no, it's not not just saying that or anything. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You cut out, cut out there a little bit. Okay. No, but yeah, no, but uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, I, I sound like a man. It feels like the themes right. of it are, you know, are being presented, but they're not the main like focus of the movie as much as it is just kind of yes. like another layer of the cake, you know, if that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. It's, it is very much a delicious cake. Uh, yes, for sure. Yeah, I really loved it. Anything else you wanted to say? Yeah, you loved it? Yeah, I, I loved it too. Um, I might give it that five-star rating like one day. One day, maybe. Maybe. I, I, I would not doubt it. I So here, here's where we kind of discuss the DVDs and Blu-rays uh, that we have of it. So I, I'll be, like I said, I have it in this 1999 Criterion DVD. Um, unfortunately, though, so like I said, it ha- it's, it's widescreen, but for like, the four by three TVs. And I have talked about a DVD before on this podcast that I have, it, which is very similar. It was my Halloween two DVD um, where it's in widescreen, but like, because it's being shown on a 16 by nine TV, it's just like this cube. It's like this rectangle surrounded by black bars. And I kept the Halloween two DVD because I thought it was funny, but like, I don't know, because I love and respect Brazil so much. I, I, <sighs> It's distracting this time. Like with Halloween 2, that was funny. But like here, it's distracting. And I also can imagine the that. subtitles on this DVD were awful. Like they were so poor in like what the characters were actually saying. And they were so like slow. Like they'd say what the characters are saying like 
two seconds after they said it. It was it was really, really distracting. So uh, you have this on the Criterion Blu-ray? I have the Criterion Blu-ray for it. Okay. So it's white so it's widescreen, but not the kind of widescreen you're watching. Okay, yeah. Convince me to buy the Criterion Blu-ray, please. Yeah. I wish it was on 4K. So, Is it on 4K? I, I have no idea. But that would be yeah, cool though, please, if it was. Um, but yeah, so it's the Criterion. So it's so it has like the Love Conquers All uh on the Criterion Blu-ray. It does, yeah. So it, it has, has the black bars and the four by three uh, rate aspect ratio for the TV cut. It even has it some of the kind of uh, TV quality like recording to it. So I think that's kind of okay. cool. What what about the final cut? Is that in four by three? Oh no no that's that's a uh, sixteen by nine like the full okay. like, r- aspect all right. ratio. All right, you've convinced me. So honestly, that's a good thing. So I love this movie. I love this Criterion but I'd rather have it on like the Criterion Blu-ray. So am I keeping this Brazil Criterion DVD? Unfortunately, no. I think it's a neat piece of history, but I love and respect the movie so much that I need it in its highest quality. So I want the Criterion Blu-ray, but not the Criterion DVD. So unfortunately, this will not be staying in the collection. I will definitely be keeping my Criterion Blu-ray. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So I'd, I'd like glad. to watch it again one day again. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm watching this again someday soon. I don't, I, I love it too much. I'm, I'm so glad you recommended this for the podcast because I'm so glad. I love when I find new movies to love and adore. It's a lot of fun. It's very, very cool. Yeah. I've been meaning to rewatch it. Cause like I, I haven't watched it in so long and I didn't really remember everything I fully appreciate about it the first time, but like everything I do appreciate about it, now is like i a lot more than i did before so you know mm. yeah it's that's why i think yeah. the second viewing is so important when it comes to movies because you really don't know yeah. how you feel about it until you know then a lot of my favorite movies i didn't fully love until like the second time i watched it oh yeah no totally i am a huge believer in movies uh what i like to call rewatchability. um like i i think it's important to rewatch movies like or it's important to know which movies you want to rewatch because some movies you don't want to rewatch, in which case it's like, okay, did that movie actually mean anything to you? And if, you know, if you're not willing to rewatch a movie, then like, you know, that kind of tells you how important it actually is to you personally. Uh, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, that is something I've always been a huge uh, believer in. So, yeah. Yeah. Did it kind of remind you of Dune a little bit? The, uh, uh i think like the whole like sequences of like denny villanois dune when he's like like picturing the uh, zendaya's character and in, in his head and uh you know before he eventually meets her at the end that kind of reminded me of brazil brazil a little bit oh yeah yeah that yeah, that's a good way of putting it i i need to rewatch dune 2021 uh i haven't seen the david lynch dune out. i have i've seen the david lynch <laughs> dune yes i, I heard I it's not very good <laughs> uh i hated it the first time i the second time i was like all right this is kind of funny it, it it's kind of charming and how terrible it is but make no mistake it's bad uh the 2021 one uh is very good from what i remember i don't know if it's five stars worthy as i gave it i i need to rewatch it i own it on blu-ray so i'll have to get it on 4k blu-ray it. someday yeah that's before part two comes out make an episode on it is part two coming out this year it is yeah uh Ooh. It's coming out a week before the Marvel, so I don't know how it's going to do, but, you know, oh. it'll st- hopefully it'll still be great. Yeah, hopefully, because I did like the first one. So First I really, part, yeah. I, I might just do, I might do an episode on that when the sec- when the sequel comes out then. I think that'll be a good idea. Ooh. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, all right, uh, Lazy, uh, I'd say that just about does it. Um, why don't you shout out your stuff? please. Okay, so I have a letterboxed. It is Lazy Bones Inc. So L-A-Z-Y-B-O-N-E-S-I-N-C. <laughs> That's just how I just spelled it out. Nice, nice. Uh, anything else you want to shout out or just letterboxed? Nah, just letterboxed. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Like you said, you don't use Twitter or YouTube anymore, which... <laughs> God, I wish that was me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But anyway, yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having talking me. Talking about Cocaine Bear and Brazil. Really Two fun. movies released by the same studio. Ex- is it? Yeah. Universal. Universal. Wow. <laughs> yeah, look at us. Again, with the unintentional coincidence. Film knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, thanks for coming on. And thank you, the listener, for listening to us ramble uh, like crazy people about these two movies. Uh, if you want to support the show, give us a like, give us a comment on, give us a listen on YouTube and Spotify and Apple podcasts. And I don't know, whatever. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Thanks for listening. And uh, always remember uh, the bear did cocaine. He did cocaine. It fucking did cocaine. Uh, all right. Bye-bye. Good night, Tri-State area. Yeah.